I'm Scott Allen Miller, and this is my life living in Nicaragua. Today, I want to talk about my hat. I've got a bottle cap on the back of this hat, and I've only had this hat for maybe two years at most. It comes from Costa Rica, and the bottle cap has actually already oxidized away. It's turned into green tin alloy or something and is dissolving. That's pretty crazy. Okay. Today, we're going to be talking about why it is crazy important that you stop texting, literally texting, not things that people miss call texting, actually stop texting and get everyone that you're involved with to stop texting. Because if you're going to be moving abroad or someone you know is going to be moving abroad or someone's going to vacation or anyone you know ever might have an emergency of any type, you need to be a lot safer and capable of reliable communications than texting will allow. It doesn't matter whether you're traveling or not, but the more you travel and the more you do things abroad, the more acute this problem becomes, but it isn't a problem that comes from traveling. It's a problem that traveling helps to expose. So we're going to get into how you protect yourself and what you avoid right after the bump. Today's video comes up because I recently had an issue where I tried to move my Tigo SIM card to an eSIM. Everything seemed to go great. They messed it up. They completely hosed my number. And because of the way that everything links through cell phone numbers these days, it destroyed everything on my phone. So I'm unable to use any service that relies on cellular identity of any sort, including lines that are not the ones that were ruined. This is really complicated, but it's important because it highlights fragility in many of the things that people do every day. Now, for normal things, I still have my computers, I still have my phone itself, I still have Wi-Fi working without a problem, I still have multiple devices, I have a million ways to get in contact with anyone who's interested in communications. I use tools like WhatsApp, Telegram, Signal, Nika Abla, email, and more. I'm very easy to get a hold of, and I even have an American landline in my house here in Nicaragua. So if you need to reach me, I am unbelievably, reliably reachable. Even if my phone gets completely destroyed, my phone gets driven over by a semi-truck, there's nothing left of it whatsoever, the, the SIM cards are destroyed, I can't remember my number, all those things, I can still go to any computer and sign into all those other services and keep communicating. And that doesn't even include the ones I have for the office. These are just my personal ones. I have so many backup tools that there's no way any one anything could cut me off. This is important when really you're just living in the modern world. But if you're going to be living abroad, it becomes more important because the ability of walking down the street and finding someone you know and saying, hey, I need all these methods of communicating back to my family and friends and people that I know. Uh, do you have their numbers? Do you have ways to communicate with them? Do you have access? Right. What if what if you just got cut off by everything? When you live in a place where you know a lot of people and they have all the same access and knowledge that you do, it's pretty easy to get into contact with somebody who can get into contact with everyone else. But when you are isolated in a new country, it is easier to run into a situation where you need to rely on your own devices, which is one of the reasons why I'm very adamant that people not just rely on a single cell phone, that you don't rely on uh, you know, a single device. You always travel with a cell phone, a laptop, probably a tablet, for me, normally it's, you know, I have a number of devices, my wife has a number of devices, each of my kids has a number of devices. We always have backups for everything. There's always a way to reach somebody through, and every one of us has many different communications channels. It's very, very hard to imagine a scenario where we would be cut off. And when we're here at the house, desktops, laptops, you name it, it just goes and goes and goes. We have so much reliability. And then the last thing is the desk phones. So we're very, very protected. but when talking to, and this came up today, because I had this problem with my phone, it doesn't affect anything I normally do, but today I needed to reach someone. And I've written papers 10, 15 years ago about why texting is absolutely abhorrent and no one should be doing it. Now, back then there were different issues. Some of those that are important to understand though, we're talking texting. Texting never means anything but SMS, a specific protocol over the cell phone, okay? People sometimes, not very often, but sometimes loosely use the term texting to refer to secure messaging tools like WhatsApp. That is never texting. If someone says text, texting is a specific thing like email. Email is not some general term. It is an extremely specific thing using the SMTP protocol. 
texting is a very specific thing using the SMS and MMS protocols. It is, there's no exception to that. When you text, you have to use the cellular network, you have to use the specific protocol, and it has to be, by definition, insecure and super fragile. It always has to pass through the government coordination system, just like the, the old switch telephone network, and it cannot be encrypted. So this is one of the reasons why iMessage from Apple and RMS from Google, they're trying to come up with these layers to make something that seems like texting, but this is dangerous because these tools hijack your texting software and pretend to you that they're texting, but actually do something quite different. They use something like WhatsApp, but they rely on the text infrastructure under the hood to identify you. Well, that's great in a way. It sounds wonderful. You've got people who just won't stop doing the worst possible thing. So they decided that if you have that, they're just going to hijack it and they're going to force them into something modern, whether they like it or not. And they're going to trick them into thinking they're doing something bad and actually do something good. Their hearts are in the right place. The problem is if you have an underlying fragile ecosystem and something goes wrong with it, it can break the things on top. So that's where I am at this point that my FaceTime, which I never use, and my iMessage, which I never want to use, I would never intentionally use iMessage or at RMS. I would never use anything associated with the texting ecosystem unless there was an absolute need, in which case that need would only come from it being a need to text. But all those things are broken because the underlying SMS broke in my case. This is not a very common thing. It's not a thing that you normally have to think about and be like, oh, but, but it normally works for me. When you start moving abroad, you start realizing how often these things can break for a lot of reasons. One, other countries don't rely on it the way the United States does. They're not using it for two-factor authentication. They can't. People's numbers change all the time. The idea that your, your texting number would be stable is a completely North American unique concept. The whole, like, we just text you a, a code to verify who you are applies basically nowhere in the world. So that is completely an Americanism. Just the idea that we would use that as a security mechanism is an Americanism. It really shows a complete introversion in America because if you had any global scope, you'd instantly say, well, that's not gonna work for tons and tons of people or they're gonna have to do something really weird to make it work. Uh, so, so that alone, very, very different. So in much of the world, your numbers are changing all the time. So that causes problems. Um, in much of the world, uh, there's no reliance on it because of that. They've never relied on these numbers being stable. So they don't design anything around them being stable. They don't care if they break your texting because it's not important. Right? Nobody's actually relying on it, like here in Nicaragua or in Europe or in all kinds of places. Everybody's got secure messaging. Now, sometimes, you know, you find someone who's confused and they think that's texting. And so they keep swearing, no, I text people when they're, in fact, doing something that is very much not texting. But if you have, like I have, family in the United States and you need to contact them, and the only thing they have is legacy texting. Now, hopefully my phone is going to work, right? But the only path I have to send anything other than a phone call is texting, and I have no means of sending a text. I have a working U.S. phone that's supposed to have unlimited texting, but because of the layered security stuff on top of the texting mechanism, it doesn't let me send a text. I can't send from my Nicaraguan number. That number has been lost just in the last two weeks, right? I have to delete the SIM, and there's no way back, right? They're, they're like, oh, we can issue a new SIM and start over. So I had a funny discussion about this that I'm with Tigo and I, we've talked about this a bit. I'm going to make the switch to Claro and I kept saying up until now, I have no reason to pick one over the other. The only thing that drives me to one is I guess I get some amount of redundancy because my T-Mobile uses Claro with the towers. And so if I fall back to that, I'm on Claro, then, then it's better to have Tigo for other things. But Tigo completely destroyed my phone and their answer to it doesn't work and you broke it is, well, we don't know what to do. Give us more money. And they so they charged me two weeks of service to move to the eSIM, plus they charged me to move to the eSIM, just threw away my number. They took my number off the phone and deleted it from their systems. Apple sent me a message. Tigo has blown your account away. You no longer are, are registered with that phone. Uh, so my number just doesn't exist in the universe anymore, right? It's no longer a functional phone number. And then when I went and said it doesn't work, they said, well, you have to, you have to recharge your phone. I'm like, I did, just did. I paid for it. And and it shows it's here on my Tigo app. It shows that I re recharged it. It shows I have lots of service. And they're like, nope, you've got to do it again. No one ever, they took your money. They didn't, they didn't put it in the system. 
I'm like, okay, so you just said they stole from me, which they did not do. This is a technical glitch, but their claim was that the guy stole my money, $3. And they're like, you have to give us another $3. So I do it right in front of them, do $3, re-up it, and it still doesn't work. And they're just like, well, we could start over and give you a new SIM and we could put the number on it, but can they? They've just established that they can't do that with my current system. Why would they be able to do it with a new one? That makes no sense. And everyone's like, well, just have them give you a brand new number. But this makes absolutely no sense. I understand the failover thing that I just said has a little bit of value, but I've now been without a working phone for weeks and Tigo has charged me multiple times and they have zero initiative or capability to fix anything. And it's 100% just a configuration thing that they did. Why would I, if I'm starting over, and have zero ties to Tigo, and the only thing I have to differentiate Tigo from Claro is that Tigo has significantly mis mistreated me, stolen my money, and cannot make their system work, and Claro, I don't know. Well, obviously I'm gonna move to Claro. That would be, I would have to be insane to go back to Tigo under that circumstance, given I have zero reason not to go to Claro because we're completely even at this point. I'm starting over. I have to get a new SIM card and start the process as if I just, just arrived in the country. That I was on Tigo previously means absolutely nothing because everything that was done is gone. I have to start completely fresh. I'm a brand new customer to both companies, but one has a really serious train wreck of negatives. And none of them are, are you know, huge, but that they messed it up, that they didn't fix it on the spot, that they didn't fix it when I returned, that at every case they're taking more money, and that they have no actual path forward. Their only hope is that completely starting over might work, but they already suggested that it doesn't, so they don't actually know. Moving to Claro makes way way more sense. So that's what I'm going to be doing, but I need time to go do that. So right now I'm working off of my T-Mobile, which is super slow, and I'm hoping that the phone starts to work. But all of this is why my SMS broke, because even though I don't use the Tigo to text the United States, that Tigo broke because of the way everything's intertwined on phones today. It took all of my texting, all of my layered things that go on top of that that I never use with it. So suddenly... I don't even have the T-Mobile service that I used to have because Tigo took it out. So that's a really significant problem. But my WhatsApp works fine. My Telegram works fine. My Signal works fine. My Nika Ablo works fine. My email works fine. All those things are great. All the things you should be using, all the secure, free, universal services work great. And again, even if my phone stopped working completely, if it just the battery burned up, you drove over it, you dropped it in the ocean, all of those other services are on my desktop and don't rely on the phone. I can keep communicating with people no matter what device I have. But if the only device I have is my phone, the only thing that's different is I can send SMS messages. And of course, they demonstrably, when they do arrive, are often hours later. Well, if that's something important, you need to get a hold of someone, that's not very reliable. So the thing that I want to get across is there is no situation where a text message is a good thing. They're not secure. They're not fast. They're not reliable. And they can cause issues beyond just the text messaging system. And there are free alternatives that are universal, completely free, secure, and free you from being tied not just to a legacy technology, not just tied to very expensive services that have to pay to, to send those messages, because every single text message, someone has to pay for that, and they constantly extort businesses and individuals and say, oh, you know, your friend paid to send you a message, but you have to pay to receive it, or vice versa. All kinds of things that you don't see unless you work in the phone space, but as someone who works with phone companies, you as a customer pay to receive text. You may not realize it, but when you get a phone service, one of the things in that bill is paying to receive text messages. But the people who are sending you the text messages also have to pay for you to receive it, not just for them to send it. They have to pay for that too. They have to pay for themselves to send it and in certain cases have to pay additionally for you to receive it. If they don't pay the extortion fee, your phone company typically, and the examples are T-Mobile, AT&T, and Verizon all do this every single time. If someone from a business sends a text to their network, now remember, their customer paid to receive it, so they're deceiving their customer, and the other person paid their carrier to put it onto the network, which they were deceived because they've already paid to send the message. Then your phone company, whichever one you have, if you're in the U.S., blocks your message and keeps it 
and extorts the sender unless they pay rather a bit of money in order to pass it on through. And to get away from this being a crime, they use a third party extortion racket that does the actual processing of this for them so they can point to them and say, well, right, it's their problem. And that company can say, well, we're not the ones receiving it. It's a real handy workaround that is standard in messaging in the US. They're, this is tried and true from the email world. There's a lot of extortion that goes on there as well. And these are, this is how they do it, right? The US law completely overlooks when you have a third party hijack messages and block people from receiving things that they've paid for. And so it's a way of double or triple charging for that message to come through. You don't get that with those other services. Once you pay for internet access, you have internet access. Internet access is protected in most countries, but phone and texting is not. They can extort you any amount that they want. You have no rights as a phone or text user in North America. That's an important thing to understand. Not only do you not have privacy or reliability, you don't have rights. If you pay for that service, they are under no obligation to provide you the service you've paid for. And they can do the same thing with your phone calls. They can decide someone didn't pay enough to call you and they can, without your permission or telling you, simply block their calls and say, look, we'll put your call through, but only if you pay us more. That's what they're doing with the text messages. They can do it with the calls that they want, except for 911 calls. That would be the one exception. It's understanding that these things happen, that there's no reason to have these kinds of risks and complications and costs and, and to be tied to a device free, secure, and reliable, and the ability to see that someone has sent a message. All those things, completely available. So it's important when you're gonna be traveling, we talk about this a bit, as just a standard skill when you're moving to a new country, you need to be on WhatsApp, because that's what we use in nearly the entire world. If you're coming here to Central America or Latin America, you gotta have WhatsApp. Know how it works, have it set up, make sure everyone you wanna talk to already knows how to communicate with you, has you in their, in their contact list and all that, and it will make your life easy, plus all the businesses you're gonna work with here, that's what they're gonna use. But importantly, you gotta get the people who aren't going to travel to understand that if they don't move to safe, secure, modern mechanisms that they are voluntarily creating a fragility that easily could result in some degree of you not being able to reach them or them not being able to reach you for no reason. It's not saving them money. It's not making things more convenient for them. It's making everything harder for everybody. Everybody loses with text messaging. I've been saying this for 20 years and it has played out time and time and time again. No one has ever in 20 years demonstrated to me any situation where text messaging had any sanity whatsoever. And because remember, it wasn't created. You couldn't get text messaging until after better alternatives were already wild, widely on the market. Secure email was normal before insecure text messaging entered popular use. So going to it was an intentional step back during the hipster era and somehow it's remained and it is one of the most awful things, but it's something you can fix, but you need to go to people in your ecosystem and say, please stop using texting, at least with me. Get WhatsApp, get Telegram, get Nika Abla, do something to be secure, do something to be reliable, do something so you're not tied to this device that someone steals it, now they have your identity. Right? When you send a text message, you're saying, I don't care who receives it, I care what device receives it. When, when does any sane person care about getting a message to a device instead of to the person they assume has the, de the device? Except in the situation where maybe the device is stolen and you wanna be able to text the device and not the person and say, hey, whoever has my phone, here's how you can find me, right? Okay, that makes sense. There's better ways to handle that if that's really what we're trying to do. But that is where that idea that you're calling a mobile device that goes in someone's pocket instead of that person at whatever device they're at. Because whenever I go somewhere, I and this is one of the things I do, I put my phone somewhere to charge or to be away from me because I don't want to be distracted by my phone because everybody who knows me knows how to reach me, including all of you, right? If you look in the show notes, right, people ask me all the time, how do I reach you? I'm like, every single show note has the, if you want to reach me, here's what you do. And it's super easy. It's an email. And if you just go to the YouTube page, there's here's how to reach me, right? It's everywhere and it's consistent and it works all the time. People reach me all the time from it. So I know it works. And if you, if you use that, even you guys can reach me anytime, anywhere. I realize I don't respond that quickly because it's not my day job, but it is 
really easy to reliably get a message to me anytime, anywhere. It doesn't matter if my phone is still working. It doesn't matter if I have my desktop. It doesn't matter if I have my laptop. It doesn't matter if I'm in a, you know, traveling. It doesn't matter what country I'm in or jurisdiction I'm in. Anytime I get any internet access on any device, I can be reached through any message except through regular traditional phone calls and text messaging. Those are the exception. They are the one thing that still lingers on in the modern world that won't reliably get to me. I have to be in a spot where I have working SMS. I have to have a working phone. I have to have a working line for it. I have to have an agreement between wherever I am and the person who's trying to reach me. And I have to be in a jurisdiction that allows that communication. So there's lots of countries that we travel to that don't allow that. Now we don't do that very often, but some of you will go to countries where that's not even an option. And you get there and you're like, oh, I've got all these services. I've paid for a million things. And then you find out it doesn't work. And I did that with Verizon. In 2012, we spent a bunch of time in Europe and found out that even though we were paying a super huge amount per day and they had given us a special phone for it, they didn't actually enable text messaging or anything. And we were out of communications for months because they simply didn't enable it and there was no fallbacks and no support and nothing they could do. The system just is unreliable. Most people are used to dealing with that unreliability, but when you're a traveler, it can be dangerous. Sorry for harping on, but this is a really important topic that there is any person still using text today, anyone who's going into iMessage, anyone who's going into FaceTime, anyone who's going into text someone, anyone who's going to RMS, that those apps even exist on the phone show that we as a culture have a problem to overcome yet, and that you ever have to think about someone sending you a message that way, that we, and this really is acute right now, it is because We've allowed those things to linger on, that we are able to be spammed by both le legitimate politicians and scammers pretending to be politicians because they are given a free pass and unlimited, unfettered access to spam you and to deceive you via the text messaging system. The text messaging system literally exists for the sole purpose. Let me be absolutely clear on this. The only reason that this is legally allowed to exist is because it is unsecure. So your communications are completely spied on by the government. Every word you send on text is recorded by the government and seen, as is this video on YouTube, which is completely public. And that the people who want to scam you, which includes government officials, are guaranteed that they will have access to your phone no matter what you choose to do. You can mark it as spam. You can attempt to block it. You cannot block it when politicians, not your government, but politicians, people who register as politicians, are given free reign to spam you, and there's nothing you can do legally to stop it. It is beyond your power. By having text messaging, that enables that scam. And so that's a really important thing. If you receive a message on text, remember, it's never legitimate. It's never a legitimate business. It's never a legitimate reason to reach out. It's never a legitimate path of reaching out. That is a terrible, terrible mechanism. And everyone really does know it. People just, for some reason, love being taken down that rabbit hole of the government pushes you to do things. So why not? The government wants me to do it. Can't be bad, right? Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to help support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. And as always, I'll see all of you tomorrow.